Well, here we are. We're at the uh, Allen Brooks Nature Center down on the lower hill to the northeast of the center itself, uh, close to our vernal or ephemeral pond project, which has been in the making for about five or six years. Uh, this project started with the idea that in this uh, xerophytic environment, uh, there are few places that animals can get free water during the uh, during the growing season or during the frost-free season, and that those oases, if you will, of, uh, of water are very, very important to survival and uh, maintenance of a variety of animal populations. Uh, a spadefoot toad, for instance, is a prime example, and of course deer, coyote, and, and other mammals are important as well. This is uh, Agripyrum spicatum, or blue bunch wheatgrass. It's uh, one of the most common of the bunch grasses in North Okanagan grassland. It's scattered around our site uh, naturally and uh, seed was collected a couple of years ago, germinated and grown this last winter, winter 2007, at the uh, Forestry Research Station in small plug containers in a styroblock format, just like we grow our commercial tree seedlings in. And then <clears throat> starting in June, one of the uh, uh, guides at the Allen Brooks Nature Center uh, took those plants and created small depressions and started planting them around the site. Um, we're going to be planting more of these next year as well as western fescue which looks somewhat similar at least at this stage and uh, try to re-establish as much of the bunch grass around at least around the pond as we, uh, as we can and get rid of some of the, uh, the unwanted exotics such as the napweed. So this project started as I say five or six years ago and the initial idea was to dig a fairly large uh, depression and fill it with bentonite clay, uh, a clay that's commonly used in uh, building of natural ponds or enhancement of natural ponds. And uh, quite a quantity of clay was obtained uh, about three years ago. A hole was dug, the clay was put in, and water was introduced, and the water went out the bottom. And uh, more clay was put in, and more water introduced, and the water went out the bottom. So two years ago, we decided that the way to make the pond would be to buy a commercial pond liner, uh, a rubberized material that's uh, about 12 mils thick, and lay that in the depression and cover it with uh, some soil around the edges, and put some in the middle and plant the edges. And that's just what we did last year. That's April of 2006. Uh, we bought a 40 by 60 foot pond liner. We uh, got a local equipment operator volunteer uh, that whose family has lived in this area for a long time. He has a large Volvo excavator. We dug out the old pond site, which is behind me here, and uh, carefully laid in a 40 by 60 foot liner, and then proceeded to put in some soil. Uh, <clears throat> a great many plants were introduced uh, shortly thereafter by a couple of local people, Malcolm Martin in particular, uh, a long time botanist and naturalist in this area. And you can see the cattails in the background. There are sedges and uh, juncus grass and a variety of, uh, of riparian species. There are a few other invasive grasses too, uh, quack grass in particular around the edges that uh, that's pretty nasty and this is quack grass right here. It's actually related to blue bunch wheat grass but it's uh, a, a larger, a, a more robust, more uh, uh, vigorous plant that tends to push other grasses out, particularly uh, native uh, bunch grasses, which aren't very competitive. They're a little bit about the spadefoot toad. We, coming into this season, our uh, second field season with the pond, we had not yet seen spadefoot toads here. We were hopeful, but nobody really expected to see them because the nearest known spadefoot toad environment is about oh, 600 meters from here around the hill and across 600 meters of grassland, essentially. And uh, lo and behold, in May, some tadpoles were spotted in the uh, pond. And we took a couple of them to a local uh, a naturalist, and she positively identified them as spadefoot toad uh, uh, tadpoles. Very large, actually. A body's about an inch long, larger than most other tadpoles of frog, other frogs in B.C., or toads in B.C. And so uh, we watched them carefully, and in about a month, we saw the first adult on the other side of the pond. And <clears throat> this riparian uh, environment with standing water at least part of the season is absolutely necessary for spadefoot toads because they do their, uh, their breeding around water and of course the tadpoles have to develop in water. And their life cycle is uh, geared, evolved in such a way that they go through their life cycle very quickly as the water in the uh, 
ephemeral or vernal ponds is decreasing in depth such that by the time they're down to the mud they turn into a toad essentially and uh, that toad is capable of, of making its living on land and ultimately uh, digging into the soil near the pond and hibernating during very hot periods and during the winter. It's a fascinating life cycle and uh, but it does take the wet stage and, and then subsequently the dry stage. And we've chosen to keep the pond full here so that it continues to attract a variety of animals during the summer and winter for that matter uh, so that people can see them. I've been up here several times of an evening and seen a great many dove around the edge of the pond as I approach anyway and they take off but you see deer track and coyote track uh, quite regularly in the fall particularly after a rain when you can see the tracks in the mud. So it, it tends to be a an oasis or a center of activity for animals for quite some distance, I would guess, uh, given that uh, we don't have standing water anywhere close at this time of the season at least uh, on the common range.